Let's get started because I always run out of time because I talk too much. So let's go ahead and get started. So I want to welcome you guys again. It's just so exciting each week as I anticipate seeing you guys. And we've been covering some pretty heavy topics. It's kind of the nature of apologetics as we cover the most important things in life. Uh, because those are things that we need answers to, but it does kind of create kind of a heavy environment. And I'd like to tell you tonight was lighter, but it's not. <laughs> it's not. Um, the things that we cover have great weight, great significance, and those kind of feel heavy sometimes. And I'd like to tell you that next week it's better, but that doesn't either. And so, but next week is my favorite lesson to teach. And when I tell you what it is, you're going to think there's something wrong with me. But the topic is um, evil and suffering. Why does God allow evil and suffering? I really look forward to that. I hope that you guys will join us for it. Um, I feel like it is one of the most fundamental questions that we as Christians receive, is why does God allow that? And to have good, solid answers to that um, is so beneficial. To have that in your pocket, it, it does the things that apologetics should do at its core. It builds your faith, and it gives you opportunity to give, to give answers to questions that build the faith of other people. So I hope you guys will join us for that. All right, let's open in prayer. Father God, you are creator. I've been in awe of you this week as I, as I looked at your creation. You're designer. You're the sustainer of our lives. Life, God, is your business, and it's not ours. So we humbly submit our will to you. Would you help us to understand your heart for life and help us to understand the hard questions, the things that you've put before us um, to, to handle in this life? Lord, I pray that you would um, allow us um, your uh, grace in trusting you as the one true God, and you are our teacher tonight. We pray these things in your name. So we're starting tonight with a video. It's dangerous to start the video. That means I'm either starting off really well or really bad. <laughs> to meet with Dr. Bernard Nathanson. Nathanson presided over 60,000 abortions and co-founded NARAL, Pro-Choice America, before his conversion to the pro-life movement. To beat Lee's surprise, the former abortionist agreed to an interview while dying of cancer. At the end of the interview, I felt such compassion for him because he knew the culture of death he was leaving behind, and he knew he had been the primary, the preeminent physician who led the pro-abortion movement. And I said, um, I said, Dr. Nathanson, if you have a message for America, I said, I know you're too sick to get it out. I said, but if you, if you tell me what your message is, I promise I will commit the rest of my life to delivering us your message across the country until it becomes common knowledge. He said, continue teaching the strategy, it's an eight point propaganda strategy of how I deceived America, and then tell America that the co-founder of NARAL Pro-Choice America um, says to love one another, abortion is not love, stop the killing, the world needs more love, and I'm all about love now. The propaganda point Nathanson called the most brilliant political strategy was the Catholic strategy, targeted towards American Catholic voters. So what they had to do was intentionally, intentionally separate the Catholic's religious doctrine from their legislative judgment, and they called it the Catholic straddle. And that straddle was to allow those conservative Catholics who were personally against abortion but they would sell it like this. You can remain Mr. and Mrs. Catholic voter in New York personally abhorrent to abortion, but it's okay to vote for a pro-choice candidate because it's just a personal decision between a woman and her doctor. 
the lies of abortion all came crumbling down for Nathanson when, for the first time, he saw a baby in an ultrasound. She, that little girl, was smiling. She's sucking her thumb. She's yawning. She's wiggling her toes. And the father of America's abortion industry, who founded NARAL, Pro-Choice America, who skidded the road for Roe v. Wade with propaganda, recognized the humanity of the baby in the womb. Nathanson died in 2011, but Beatley hopes his message lives on in her new book, What If We've Been Wrong? It's the same question Nathanson posed to NARAL in his resignation, which came exactly two years after the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court decision. He's asking the, the chairman of the NARAL Pro-Choice America Board of Directors, what if we've been wrong? Question mark. What an incalculable injustice will have happened. He was trying to convince the NARAL Board of Directors, we have now an ethical issue on our hand. We can no longer deny the humanity of that unborn baby. Pretty powerful, right? To see that change. The life and our issue of pro life is defensible um, because abortion can only be rejected um, because of an unbelief in science, reason, and God. You have to be able to set all three of those aside to believe and support abortion. And we as Christians must fight the temptation to believe that love is possible without truth. If we're going to love people, then we have to give them the truth. So the issue of abortion has kind of fallen out of discussion um, up until recently of, of, of Christians and in apologetics. There was a time where it was our number one discussion. Um, and even in things like when I'm teaching Veridici the past couple of years, uh, we went over it quickly because it had kind of felt like it had been settled. Um, but it was brought up again um, recently. So I know in the past couple of years, we've been distracted with things like COVID and things the war, the economy, um, but just um, this past June, actually June 24th, uh, you probably know what I'm gonna say. The United States Supreme Court released its decision of Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, and they overturned the constitutional right to an abortion. It was a landmark decision in which the court held that the Constitution of the United States does not confer a right to an abortion. It allows individual states to severely restrict or ban abortion outright. It's up to states to choose. On a little personal note, this was a, an exciting moment for me that I didn't even realize was happening. I think I've told you before that our um, kiddos go to a place called Worldview Academy. Well, and I told you about those great closing ceremonies of Worldview Academy. Well, we were walking into the closing ceremonies of Worldview Academy when the decision was announced. And it was just, I'm just sharing, because it was just a neat opportunity. I was with all these um, other moms and dads who, whose kids were at an apologetics camp for a week who had been studying this issue. And we walked in and we all got the news together. It was kind of neat just seeing the, the hugs and the smiles and and just the relief of the long, long prayers. Alrighty, so despite that change, despite that ruling, we are reminded that we still have a debate on our hands. We saw that actually when the ruling came out, because although I was in a situation where we were celebrating the decision, there were lots of people who were not celebrating that decision. Every debate on abortion is life, or death, what we're caring about tonight is life and death. And so Christians need to be reminded that uh, this most significant issue that we face, we still have to defend and we still have to pray for. All right, let's look at definitions. That's kind of a good place to start. So definitions of pro-choice, pro-life. I'm sure you guys are familiar with this. Um, pro-choice is generally defined, you get slightly different definitions, but generally defined as the belief that a woman should have the legal right to abort her unborn child at any point in a pregnancy. The pro-choice advocates believe that abortion is just a personal decision and it should not be limited by the government, the church, or anyone else. 
pro-life is defined as the belief that uh, every human life is sacred and that no one, including the mother, has the right to end an innocent life. Pro-life advocates hold the view that life from the moment of conception should be protected. But when we start talking about definitions, um, there are people who are wanting to protect their pro-choice side get a little concerned because they start sounding, um, uh, they, don't, they don't quite get all the attention for the way that they sound and they would like. So when we're in that situation, we have two options. I can either make myself sound better or you sound worse, right? So of course they choose for us to sound worse. And so I found out that one of our more recent terms uh, that, that whenever they're speaking among themselves, they don't refer to us as pro-lifers because that kind of sounds nice, right? If you're pro-life, that sounds like a good thing. So we need to rebrand you. You are now pro-forced birthers. Pro-forced birthers. <laughs> So the goal here is to paint us as a bully who is opposed to women's freedom, um, that we are forcing people to give birth, which is interesting because that really doesn't work in any other area of life. Um, so questions like, there is a law that says you cannot starve your children. So I guess now we are also forced feeders. Right, you can't starve your children. You also, um, there's also homicide laws that will keep you from killing your neighbor who has a dog that barks all night. So now you are also forced neighboring, right? So you see how we, we laugh because it's ridiculous, but they're using it. Um, and you would think that it wouldn't be um, useful, it wouldn't be, I'm sorry, I'm so distracted. <laughs> you wouldn't think that it would be effective, but it is. And I know that. I'm about to take this down. I know that because uh, because Steve and I've been in thank you, Jason. Have been in ministry long enough that we have students who've grown up in our our ministry, and we keep in contact with most of them. And um, to hear some of their circles that they live in, they're using these terms. So it, we laugh at it, but they're using it. All right, let's look at some numbers. All righty, so um, there's different numbers, but they're all, so, I can find uh, research from several different places, but they're all very close to this. Approximately 3.5% of abortions are what we call the hard cases. And we would legitimately say they're the hard cases. Um, rape, incest, and the life of the mother. We're going to talk about all of those, and those are indeed hard cases. But 96.5% of abortions are for reasons of preference and convenience. So if we're talking about abortion, it's helpful whenever you're discussing these points to stay with this group. I'm going to give you answers for this, but to stay with this group, because as, as soon as you bring up abortion, who do they want to bring up? They want to bring up the exceptions to the case, right? So we have we, we want to bring up the exceptions because these really are harder to navigate. Um, so if we would stay with these larger numbers. Now, besides this, this concerns me more than those numbers. And in uh, 2017, and could we say there's been a little bit happening in our world since 2017? Mm -hmm. Have we changed a little bit? Yeah, it's crazy how much. But in 2017, it was the last research I found on this, they, they uh, interviewed 30% of, uh, of Southern Baptists would agree that abortion should be uh, legal. That's our people. Those are evangelicals, those who hold to the Bible. 30% of us. So something has gone wrong. And honestly, as a person who loves apologetics, I, I simply think is they just don't know if you knew would those numbers be different? If you knew, would they be different? But we hear too much from the world, right? The world comes at us and the world is very vocal. Uh, we media, very vocal. The, new, the nightly news, very vocal. And so we get a lot of apologetics from the world and we don't get enough apologetics from the church. So the world is winning. 
uh, because we're not saying the truth. All right, so where do 30% of us get this idea? Much of the modern movement supporting abortion began with a woman named Margaret Sanger. You guys familiar with this name? You're not gonna like her by the end of this, I promise you. Margaret Sanger was the founder of Planned Parenthood. She founded it in 1942. She was an open racist. She was a strong supporter of Hitler's Nazi party. She was a strong believer in eugenics. She was concerned about the purification of particular races and spoke towards selective breeding of individuals. Her magazines and journals that she produced were filled with writings and articles by well-known eugenists and members of Hitler's Third Reich. I have a couple of quotes for you, just, just in case that wasn't enough to point, uh, create her image in your mind of what kind of person we're dealing with here. I have a couple of quotes from her. So her writings became quite influential. She wrote several books. One of these quotes that I came across the most merciful thing that a large family does to one of its infant members is to kill it. Yeah. yeah. We still see that uh, this extremist view in our culture today. Here's another one. If this doesn't tell you, like the like, like the plan, like this was this wasn't just um, oh, and I just came up with this idea one day that this was something that was very intentional. So she puts forth this plan. We should hire three or four colored ministers, preferably with social service backgrounds and with engaging personalities. The most successful educational approach to the Negro is through religious appeal. So they knew where their hearts were and they were going to hit them there. We don't want the word to go out that we ex want to exterminate the Negro population. So the minister is the man who can straighten out that idea if it ever occurs to any more of their rebellious members. You like this woman now, right? Birth control must lead ultimately to a cleaner race. Birth control is nothing more or less than the facilitation of the process of weeding out the unfit, of preventing birth of defectives, or of those who will become defective. If there's not an evil personified here, I don't know what is. Would you like to hear it from her own voice? Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're spotting dog. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't found your best friend, have you? No. bringing children into the world that have disease from their parents, that have no chance in the world to be a human being practically, delinquents, prisoners, all sorts of things just mark when they're born. That to me is the greatest sin. So the greatest sin among us is bringing children to the world. That would make sense for someone who is starting um, a revolution of hating our children, right? Makes sense. So we must ask, how do we defend the truth of abortion against stuff like this? Because even though this came across to us, even in this moment, as quite extreme and harsh, do you know that if you hear it over and over, enough times and enough different ways through enough different sources, it starts to seep into our society. And we start to believe at least portions of it. So we ask the question, when does life begin? When is a person created? And what is it that is being aborted? 
So we all have our opinions of these guys here, but our personal beliefs are completely irrelevant. Even as Christians, the fact that we have a belief and we have a strong opinion, our opinions matter little. The truth of scripture, which in this case is very much backed up by science, is what is relevant to our argument. The fact that science says that life begins at conception is verifiable fact. It's taught in medical schools, it's written in peer-reviewed medical journals, described in embryology textbooks, it's even been filmed with a camera. From the moment of fertilization, the child's genetic makeup is already complete. That child is already a single, unique, unrepeatable human being. At this point, the child is an individual person. At conception, a child needs no more genetic information for the rest of her life. Science affirms that unborn babies' lives begin at conception, and our faith compels us to defend it. I have another video for you, just all about the videos tonight. <laughs> this one is better than the last one, I promise. I'm still recording this. <coughs> As a pro-life apologist, uh, I hear people often trying to make the case for their pro-life views and they begin with, oh, well, life begins at conception and immediately someone tries to shut them down. Um, they're actually right on par with what science says about when life begins. The science of embryology, which is just simply means the study of embryos, has said all along that from the very beginning at conception, what we have is a living, distinct, whole, human being. We know that it's a lie that fits the definition of an organism. So all those little boxes you had to check off in seventh grade life science, you know, um, it, it uh, is, is growing. So it, and it, it's metabolized by turning food into energy, it responds to stimuli. All of these things, the unborn fits those categories. It is unquestionably alive, unquestionably distinct, a separate entity from its mother, has with its own genetic code, and un unquestionably whole. That is unlike my skin cells and I can like scratch right from the back of my hand right there, all of which contain my DNA coding and some of which are still alive on my lap, which is pretty gross. Um, those cells are a part of me and their job is to contribute to the overall function of the organism that is me. An embryo is different in kind from just any old cell. It is a whole entity in and of itself and its parts contribute to its overall function uh, and it goes on to do something that is quite remarkable, even from that single-celled stage. Uh, so living, distinct, and wholly human. Now, anyone who has some education in the scientific field is not going to deny that. And in fact, it's not just pro-lifers who would claim that the unborn is unquestionably alive and human. Um, I can think of several examples. Dr. Warren Hearn, who was an abortionist himself, um, told a Planned Parenthood conference uh, that when he was describing a particular procedure that he could feel the, the effects of dismemberment flowing through the forceps like a current. Um, Camille Paglia, who is a well-known feminist, wrote in a Salon article in 2008 that she would not refrain from calling abortion murder, which is not exactly the term I would always use, but that's the term she chose, um, that it is the annihilation of a concrete individual and not just clumps of insensate tissue. Even Naomi Wolf said the, the death of a fetus is a real death. So within the scientific community, there is agreement on the unborn being a live human. Um, where the disagreement is going to fall is, what do you mean by life begins at conception? Um, it might be human, but it's not a person yet. That's no longer a scientific argument. It's a philosophical one, um, and there are great answers to that argument as well. <coughs> I thought she did a good job of saying that. All right, so at this point, with this knowledge, the only way to justify an abortion is to find some way to dehumanize the baby elsewhere. Elsewhere. Yeah. Whoa. It's been a long day. So we use euphemisms like it's just potential life, it's pregnancy tissue, it's a clump of cells. I hear that a lot. 
And if that's the case, then you and I are in problem ourselves as well. The worst one recently that I've heard is a parasite. Judas parasite. That's right. In a 60 Minutes interview, late term abortion doctor Leroy Carhart stated, my belief is that the unborn child is a parasite. And I'll tell you that the community, the pro-choice community, uh, seized upon that and used that term as well. So it doesn't require a medical school education or uh, simply maybe a grade school textbook to know that a parasite is an organism that is different. It's a different species from its host. So why do they use this term? They use it to drive a wedge between a mother and her child emotionally. It suggests that the child in utero is not the mother's flesh and blood. They want to convince you that that child is an enemy, an intruder, or an attacker. The unborn child is not seen as one to be loved, but a foe to be feared. And all that makes a child a lot easier to kill. This dehumanizing language closely mirrors this very same racial and ethnic slurs that are used to dehumanize and destroy the unwanted wanted categories of people that we see through genocides and other historical events. So we see again that Sanger's quotes, her, her ideas that she presented um, are still very much at work even if we're not using her exact words. Now, that is the case, um, the, the parasite quote, of course, comes from one um, abortionist, but I want you to hear this time from a former abortionist. Now, I'm gonna tell you that I'm showing you the incredibly clean version, no, sanitized version of this video. If you would like to see um, this abortionist um, actually um, testifies before, uh, I think, a Senate judiciary hearing, where he goes into great detail of how he performs an abortion. I weighed out very heavily because I really wanted to show it to you and it was just, it's, it's too much, it's, it's too much. Um, but I'll show you the more sanitized testimony that I found. This is a grasping instrument. When it gets a hold of something, it does not let go. From teaching lawmakers on Capitol Hill to students in college lecture halls. 12-week baby is the width of your hand, head to rump, not counting the legs. Medical doctor Anthony Levitino teaches others about the reality of abortion. He teaches from firsthand experience. Right along with, in my residency, learning how to do deliveries and hysterectomies and all the stuff that obstetrician gynecologists do, I learned to do abortions. Levitino is a former abortionist who, by his own estimate, committed over 1,200 abortions. Now, if you had asked me at the time what I thought about the abortion issue, I wouldn't have hesitated to tell you I was pro-choice. This was a decision between a woman, her doctor, and nobody, including the baby's father, had anything to say about it. Meanwhile, Levitino was hoping to become a father himself. While doing abortions at his medical practice, at home, he and his wife struggled with infertility. She went to the best infertility expert in town, and after a lot of tests and some very difficult times, we were basically told that it was not expected that we would be able to have a child of our own. Longing for life is what led Levitino to first doubt his work as an abortionist. You know, I would do two, three, four abortions in a morning when it was my turn. And I remember during that time thinking, Gosh, I'm just throwing these kids in the garbage. Wouldn't one of these women allow us to take her baby home and care for, for our own? But of course, it doesn't work that way. The Levantinos would eventually welcome a child after choosing adoption. We were very blessed when in August of 1978, we were able to adopt a little girl that we named Heather. The next month, the Levantinos conceived a biological child of their own, a son. They were now parents, twice blessed. But tragedy would soon rock the family's world. Everything was just dandy until June 23rd, 1984, when our daughter Heather was killed out in front of our house in an auto accident. 
uh, people who have children might think they have some idea what it's like to lose a child, but if they haven't been through this themselves, they have no idea, and I hope they never find out. Carrying the pain that comes with losing a child, Levitino could no longer look at his work with the same eyes. But what do you do after a disaster? You bury your child and try to get back into your life. And I don't know how long after that my first d &E abortion was scheduled, and I re reached in with this heavy clamp called a sofa clamp and tore out an arm or a leg and just stared at it in the clamp, and I got sick. But when you start an abortion, you can't stop. You have to keep inventory. You have to make sure you get two arms, two legs, and all the pieces. Because if you don't, your patient's going to come back infected, bleeding, or dead. So I finished that abortion. And I know it sounds strange to people, but for the first time in my life, I looked. I really looked at that pile of body parts on the side of the table. And I didn't see her wonderful right to choose. And I didn't see what a great doctor I was taking care of her problem. And I didn't even see the $800 cash I just made in 15 minutes. All I could see was somebody's son or daughter. He calls that moment the beginning of the end. It's what led him to walk away from abortions and today share his unique conversion story with others. We know that whenever we encounter truth that God impacts us. We've mentioned in other lessons that um, God's law, God's truth is written on our hearts and before, even whenever before we're Christians, that we know murder is wrong. We know something whenever I harm another individual that I know that it is wrong even before I become a Christian. And so I want to spend a few moments just looking at significant scripture um, that backs up everything that we've been saying. And the science is wonderful, and I'm so grateful that we have modern science that completely backs up what Scripture says. But even before we had science, we had God, who is the creator, designer of life, and he was speaking to us about what he had created. We have several clues through Scripture. Um, this one is quite popular. I'm sure you've heard it. But I think after all of this, it's time to hear from God. Psalm 139, for you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them. The days were formed for me when, as yet, there was none of them. Luke. Fun story here. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. A couple of other neat examples that I hadn't been as familiar with as in Judges. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink, and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazareth to God from the womb to the day of his death. We see that God's plan for us before even birth. Isaiah 49, again, we see the same thing. Oh, listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother. He named my name. Isn't that beautiful? God's plan is so much different than our world. Jeremiah 1.5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Love that. That gives that speaks so strongly to, to who God has made each of us to be, and that he sees all of our days before one of them is meant to be. Um, so our culture, the lies, the pro-choice tell us that um, 
that you're not valuable until we say that you're valuable. God says you're valuable from when I say that you're valuable. And he speaks very clearly through here. One more. Galatians. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace, when was I set apart before I was even born? All right, a little bit happier video. So we, I want to show you an example of someone who, who claimed these verses personally. Uh, it was a neat testimony that I came across. It's a man of God who, he says, I was protected before birth. God protected me. And he called me out before birth, just as these verses have said. So, I was having fun with that verse. Let's see. And if you have to know that I cut out about six that I wanted to show you. <laughs> so. In fact, I'm, I'm going to email you. I was you a stereotypical troubled kid, you know, uh, poor. We were poor, we were on welfare. And uh, I was a statistic waiting to happen and, uh, until God interrupted my life at age 19. And when I was 28, I was ordained and I was assigned a church to pastor. And on that day, that very day that I was ordained and assigned a church to pastor, uh, my mom tells me of the miracle that surrounds my birth. She was uh, in high school and uh, very poor, scared and uh, the daddy was not in her life she decided to have an abortion and she went to this back room abortionist when i tell this story a lot of people think well the miracle is that god somehow changed her mind but the fact is that she actually went to the doctor she laid on the table she actually went through the process and the procedure of having an abortion if you are pregnant and you uh have an abortion and there's life still on the inside of you my religious thinking is, well, God wants me to have a baby. But my mom actually decided to go back to the same doctor. So my mom didn't abort me once, she aborted me twice. People try to figure out, well, what did she have triplets? Or maybe the doctor didn't do what he's supposed to. I mean, they try to figure out all these things. And I just feel like it was a miracle that God preserved my life. When I give my testimony in churches, I give my testimony in uh, pregnancy care centers and banquets and stuff. I try to minister and be aware of the women that are sitting in the audience that may uh, be thinking, wow, you know, my abortion went through. I did destroy my life. And maybe he could have been a preacher. He could have been, been this and been that. I try to minister to them that they don't live in condemnation and shame. Number one, that's not what God is about. That's not the heart of God. God's grace is so thoroughly complete. If we believe the Bible, then you have a baby in heaven, but it's never been the will of God that you live the rest of your life beating yourself up. You be a voice of forgiveness and be a voice for grace. God can bring life out of death and he can use what the enemy meant for your harm and turn it around for your good. And I love this scripture, Hosea 2 and 14. It, it says that God would take your valley of trouble and make it a door of hope. God knew you, he planned you, he formed you. You're not, a, you're not a child of the devil, you're not a mistake. I love that, I love his story of exactly where the scripture is. Where do I go? He is the living example of that scripture. All right, so we've covered the, the scientific part, the medical part. Um, I find that whenever we come into these discussions, um, there's always that part, the medical part, there's also the philosophical part. So they might say, someone who is in opposition to your stance might say, um, okay, that's fine, they are human, but they are not a person, and there is a difference according to them. So um, there is a there's an acronym that we use to help um, defend those uh, that argument. So the only difference uh, between us and an unborn child are four things. We use the acronym SLED, S-L-E-D, and that helps us remember those um, each of those items. So the first thing is size, 
is L, uh, is, size is S. <laughs> I promise you I know my alphabet. <laughs> All right, L is level of development, E, environment, D, degree of dependency. So we're gonna use those, I'm gonna tell you what those are in just a moment, and we use those to make an argument for uh, the fact that the child is not just human, but is a person and has intrinsic worth um, more than just its biology. So we begin with size. So we would uh, never uh, decide on the grounds of size whether a person was a human or a person. So we wouldn't say that a small child is more human or more of a person than an adult. We would never say that an extremely tall NBA basketball player is more of a person than someone of my height. <laughs> no one would argue that harming a small child is less of a crime than harming an older child, right? So smaller does not equal less value of life. So the fact that a preborn baby might be very small has nothing to do with whether it is a person. Second, level of development. If you go to argue this on a college campus, they love to, to work on this argument, level of development. So an unborn child is certainly much less developed than you or I. However, one's development does not determine personhood. All of us are developing in degrees. We would say that a high school student is intellectually less developed than a college graduate. Right? Does that make a high school student less human? Don't answer that. <laughs> I, was, I was writing that and I was like, is that a good argument? I don't know. I don't know. These guys have had teenagers. So. Alrighty, E, environment. An unborn child is just in a different environment than a born child. Um, so where we are should not determine who we are. Right? If I walk into one building, I am not a different person than when I walk into a different building. Therefore, environment has no bearing on our personhood. Where you are does not determine whether you're a person or not. And lastly, the degree of dependency. And this one is given as a, a pretty strong argument. That the unborn baby is undeniably dependent upon his or her mother, and yet being dependent does not make one less or more human or a person. So we have adults who maybe some of us are dependent upon a medication or a caregiver, maybe a diabetic or someone who's on dialysis. Because they are dependent upon, they're dependent upon something else to maintain or sustain their life does not mean that they're not a person. So the fact that a, 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 an unborn child is dependent upon its mother does not make it not a person. So our degree of dependency has nothing to do with whether we are human or a person. All right, sometimes um, our um, pro-choice friends will use um, disgusting images to get our minds uh, towards their arguments, but I promise you I won't leave this up here for long, but this is an argument that we're seeing quite a bit, that abortion is Healthcare. Thank you, Heather. That's my <laughs> As far back as 1967, Dr. Detmeyer wrote, he says, even then, he said, today, it is possible for almost any patient to be brought through pregnancy alive, unless she suffers from a fatal illness such as cancer or leukemia. And if so, abortion would still be unlikely um, to prolong or save her life. So the purpose of real health care is to restore and maintain proper functioning of the human body. When a woman's reproductive system conceives and bears life, it's simply working as it was meant to be. So why do they insist of this new slogan that abortion is healthcare? Because it helps to remove the stigma of abortion. We as Americans uh, are still a little iffy on the terms of an abortion, but we all like healthcare, right? So you just rebrand it again. So they repeat the mantra that abortion is healthcare. 
Even in rare cases when pregnancy involves life-threatening complications, and I think this is a really important point, direct killing of the preborn child is never necessary to save the life of a mother. And you're going to hear that argument a lot. And the key word there is direct killing of the child. Sometimes legitimate medical treatment inadvertently harms a preborn child in order to save the life of a mother, but that is not an abortion. Uh, for example, chemotherapy for a mother with cancer might unintentionally, unintentionally end a child's life, but that is not an abortion. An abortion is an entirely different scenario. And from what I read, most of it has to do with intent. If a child's life was taken while I am intending to treat um, its mother, uh, sometimes uh, we'll look at it again uh, in just a moment, but perhaps a child has to be delivered early, early. And so we now have two patients to deal with, but we did not, and that child may or may not survive, but we did not intentionally with the intent to kill that child deliver it for that reason. And you saw Dr. Anthony Latino, uh, Latino on, the, on the interview, and he claimed that um, he has terminated lots of pregnancies under the guise of saving a mother's life. And he said, but I will tell you now, after the fact, after these many years, that in all those cases, the number of unborn children that I had to deliberately kill was zero. So there's a global initiative that I thought was pretty cool that's coming out of Dublin. And they have created something called the Dublin Declaration. It's a global initiative. Um, and you'll see that this is as of today, how many signatures are on this declaration. And the declaration states that the purposeful destruction of the unborn is never medically necessary to save the life of a woman. So we've had this many doctors sign on to this as of today. So the abortion industry isn't healthcare, it's promoting an ideology. We saw a little glimpse of that during the 2020 coronavirus pandemic, when the abortion industry, Planned Parenthood, sued the United States um, so that it could remain open. And it argued that its functions were fundamental and life saving. <laughs> Curious choice of words. <laughs> I don't think another word uh, could be more in contradiction to what they did. So in speaking of hanging on to that, we're reminded in Proverbs that the destruction of a child is one of the things that God hates. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood. So we've looked at keeping abortion legal and the, the fight for that, but even legal abortions do not come without risks. There's, of course, always going to be one death in an abortion. There's possibly additional harm. So they will, um, sometimes a, a pro-choice will argue that even their stance should be considered pro-life because they are saving the lives of women from what would be considered illegal back alley abortions. There's one major problem with that claim and that it's false. I found a very interesting interview with the late former abortionist, Dr. Bernard Nathanson. And he was a pivotal, pivotable, thank you, player in the legalization of abortion. And he admitted in his later years to fabricating that myth of the back alley abortion crisis. He said that he used his position to lie to America and he fully admits it today. One of his quotes was, um, he said the figure that we constantly fed out to the media was that 10,000 lives are lost to unsafe illegal abortions a year. And he said they completely just fabricated that information. Nathanson said later that the false figures did exactly what they wanted them to do. They took root in the consciousness of America and they convinced us all that we needed legal abortions. But again, even in a legal abortion, as we've said, there's great harm that comes to the mother. One in 10 women experience immediate complications. 
Of those, 20% are life-threatening. So we have a list of just a few of those. Possible complications include infection, hemorrhage, pulmonary and amniotic fluid embolism, injury to the reproductive organs and other internal organs, hospitalization, possible hysterectomy, future premature birth, placenta previa, and even death. So abortion carries with it a significant um, risk of mental health issues as well. And although I think these are horrible, um, lots of times what we don't see are the undiagnosed mental health problems that come with those who have endured such tragedies as an abortion. Um, mental health problems, substance abuse from post-abortive women are found to be 81% more likely than those who don't. They are often face depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and often abuse drugs and alcohol. And that would make sense. There's a pain to dull, and we have to find a way to pain to dull pain. So we've examined abortion as the ending of a human life, and abortion is also a lifelong painful uh, experience for the mother who receives it. We've made these arguments through science, logic, and scripture, but I want to look at one other thing before we move on. The cases of rape and incest, I told you that we would, we would get there. And this is indeed a very, very hard case. Um, abortion advocates use rape and incest to justify all abortions often, even though rape and incest, um, from most of my calculations that I found, take up, uh, make up about 1% of all abortions. So rape is a terrible crime. Let's just get that um, straight out. Uh, the rapist is a criminal and he deserves to be in a penitentiary. No one takes the side of the rapist. The victim is innocent, she's done nothing wrong, and the victim is our primary focus when we speak about healing. But even so, abortion does not remove rape. Abortion will not remove the pain of rape. And that's what we, what we would want for a victim at this point. We would want to remove the pain. And if abortion could do that, then maybe that would be a strong argument, but it doesn't. Randy Alcorn gives us a strong quote. He says, there's a close parallel between the violent attack on a woman in a rape and the violent attack on a child in an abortion. Both are done at the expense of an innocent person. The violence of abortion is never a solution for the violence of rape. That baby is not responsible and should not be punished for the circumstance of her conception. No child would ever be, uh, would choose to be conceived and raped. The dignity of life of a person has nothing to do with the circumstance of their conception. No child should be devalued or punished because of the sins of their father. So this sounds very heavy, and I'm thinking, yeah, it's true, and it's hard. Um, I can't imagine being in that position. So I went in search of interviews. I wanted to, I wanted to hear firsthand from, from those who might be in this circumstance, and of course it's only one percent. It's, it's sometimes hard to find these. I found a, a case that I thought was particularly hard because it was a it was a young teen girl who had had an abortion after a rape. And I captured a few quotes from her interview. She says, no one, including myself, ever considered what would happen after my abortion. No one considered that I would be adding another tragic anniversary to my life. The girl explained that she did not want her baby to remind her of her rape, and that is understandable. But then she passionately explained how the very opposite happened. The rape and the abortion became parallel traumas. They fed off of each other. The decision that was supposed to help her move on from this horrific event only magnified her pain. She said when she thought of one, she would automatically think of the other, and they were both tragic, and they were both losses in her life, and that she wishes that someone would have stopped her 
for you. So the last thing we would want is to magnify pain. If we can convince someone in that moment that this only magnifies your pain, because our, our, in our humanity, we want, to, we want to relieve pain in a situation like that. And if we tell them that, I don't know if, whole, if carrying the baby is going to relieve pain, but I can tell you what will make it worse. You can make it worse. I don't know if we can make it better, but I know that we can make it worse. So even in a sad story, we see that God is, God is wise in his decisions and telling us about life and its value. Because whenever we ignore uh, the truths and the premises of his word, we inflict more pain on ourselves and those around us. So where is the hope? We'll finish on hope because we need some at the end of all this. So we know that God in his goodness always provides hope. So first of all, before we uh, give all of the uh, reasons for God's hope, or a few of them, um, I want you to know that it's important for us as Christians to learn some of these answers because it is a matter of life and death. And you can prevent uh, a further pain in someone's life. So what do we as Christians do in response to all this? I'll tell you what we are doing and something that I'm, I'm quite proud to say that we as Christians are very much involved in uh, the pursuit of life. There are over, over 3,000 pro-life pregnancy centers in America. We are actively ministering to women. Those pro-life pregnancy centers have to date served over 2 million people. That's not a slight number. We're ministering to people. We're helping them with financial resources, counseling, medical needs, parenting classes, and even supplies for their babies. So God is providing. He provides for these extreme cases um, that no one would want to find themselves in. No one, no pain is beyond the reach of God. He is, uh, provides goodness and love to his people who are in the midst of this. If we need his forgiveness, he offers it freely to each of us despite. And he heals he heals hearts, and he heals lives. Forgiveness is one of the marvels of God's grace, and his healing power is magnificent for, for everyone, despite whether you've been involved in abortion or not. When God forgives, we are forgiven. When God cleanses, we are made clean. And that is a great cause of celebration.